Hello, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today I'm posting my readings from Richard Vermbrand's book, In God's Underground. Richard Vermbrand and his wife Sabina were Romanian Jews who converted to Christianity in 1936. Sabina had been a chemistry student at the Sorbonne. Richard had been a stockbroker and self-professed playboy, then became a Lutheran pastor. When the communist army occupied Romania after World War II, both of them became leaders in the underground church. Richard was arrested twice, spending a total of 14 years in prison for preaching the gospel. He endured torture, brainwashing, and three years in solitary confinement. While he was in prison, Sabina was told that he was dead, and then she was arrested and interred at a work camp for three years while their son Mihai was cared for by members of the underground. In 1965, Richard was ransomed out of the Soviet Union by a mission group in Norway, and he came with his family to the States. He testified before a U.S. Senate committee, displaying his scars and witnessing of the torture of thousands of members of the underground church. Then he and Sabina started their own mission that served the persecuted church around the world. Richard wrote many books in his lifetime. Sabina wrote one called Pastor's Wife. This is no less moving than the one I'm going to read, um, and I'm going to be reading this one upcoming. Together, these books make the most powerful story of Christian endurance that I've ever read. I read them first about 25 years ago, and I was taught so much about the Christian life as I contemplated them and their deep joy and assuredness. This book runs parallel to Richard's, Richard's more famous book, Tortured for Christ. Tortured for Christ was an urgent message to the Christians in the West to wake up and pay attention to what was happening in the underground church over there and to support them. It was an electrifying book. It was shocking. And I think that this one is a little different. This one was written, um, I think, about a year after Tortured for Christ was written, and it has a different tone in it more reflective. Uh, I think it's easier to hear his great refinement of mind. He's a magnificent storyteller, and his heart is overflowing with love for Jesus Christ and for his enemies. Sabina died in 2000. Richard died a year later, and I have put a link to both obituaries below, as those obituaries appeared in the Guardian newspaper of London. There's also a link to an interview that he and Sabina did back in the 1980s. I had been seven months in Kalea Rahova prison. It was October and the winter was already on us. We suffered much from cold now, as well as hunger and ill treatment, and months of winter lay ahead. Gazing from my window at the sleet falling on the prison yard, I shivered, yet my spirits were not low. Whatever I could do for God by patient love in jail would be small, I thought, but the good in life always looks small in comparison with the amount of bad. While evil in the New Testament is depicted as a huge beast with seven horns, the Holy Spirit descended as a little dove. It is the dove which will defeat the beast. One evening, a plate of savory goulash appeared with four whole slices of bread. Before I could eat it, the guard returned and made me gather up my things and follow him to a place where other prisoners were lined up. Thinking of my lost goulash, I went by truck to the Ministry of the Interior. This splendid building is much admired by tourists who do not know that it is built over an extensive prison with a labyrinth of corridors and hundreds of helpless inmates. My cell was deep underground, a light bulb shone from the ceiling on bare walls, an iron bedstead with three planks, and a straw pallet. Air entered through a pipe high in the wall. I saw there was no bucket, and I would have to wait always for the guard to take me to the latrine. This was the worst imposition for every prisoner. Sometimes they made you wait for hours, laughing at your pleadings. Men and women, too, went without food and drink for fear of increasing their agony. I myself have eaten from the dish in which I fulfilled my needs without washing it because I had no water. 
The silence here was practically complete, deliberately so. Our guards wore felt-soled shoes, and you could hear their hands on the door before Key found Locke. Now and again, there was a far-off sound of a prisoner hammering steadily on his door or screaming. The cell allowed only three paces in each direction, so I lay down and stared at the bulb. It burnt all night. Since I could not sleep, I prayed. The outside world had ceased to exist. All the noises I was used to, the wind and rain in the yard, steel boot studs on stone floors, the buzz of a fly, a human voice, were gone. My heart seemed to shrink, as if it too would stop in this lifeless silence. I was kept in solitary confinement in this cell for the next two years. I had nothing to read and no writing materials. I had only my thoughts for company, and I was not a meditative man, but a soul that had rarely known quiet. I had God, but had I really lived to serve God, or was it simply my profession? People expect pastors to be models of wisdom, purity, love, truthfulness. They cannot always be genuinely so, because they are also men. So, in smaller or greater measure, they begin to act the part. As time passes, they can hardly tell how much of their behavior is play-acting. I remembered the deep commentary which Savonarola wrote on the 51st Psalm in prison, with his bones so broken that he could sign the self-accusatory paper only with his left hand. He said there were two kinds of Christian, those who sincerely believe in God and those who, just as sincerely, believe that they believe. You can tell them apart by their actions in decisive moments. If a thief, planning to rob a rich man's home, sees a stranger who might be a policeman, he holds back. If, on second thoughts, he breaks in after all, this proves that he does not believe the man to be an agent of the law. Our beliefs are proved by what we do. Did I believe in God? Now the test had come. I was alone. There was no salary to earn, no golden opinions to consider. God offered me only suffering. Would I continue to love him? My mind went back to one of my favorite books, the Pateric, concerning certain fourth century saints who formed desert monasteries when the church was persecuted. It has 400 pages, but the first time I picked it up, I did not eat, drink, or sleep until I had finished it. Christian books are like good wine. The older, the better. It contained the following passage. A brother asked his elder, Father, what is silence? The answer was, My son, silence is to sit alone in your cell in wisdom and fear of God, shielding the heart from the burning arrows of thought. Silence like this brings to birth the good. O oh, silence without care, ladder to heaven, O oh, silence in which one cares only for first things and speaks only with Jesus Christ. He who keeps silent is the one who sings, My heart is ready to praise thee, O Lord. I wondered how you could praise God by a life of silence. At first, I prayed greatly to be released. I asked, You have said in Scripture that it is not good that a man should be alone. Why do you keep me alone? But as days passed into weeks, my only visitor was still the guard who brought wedges of black bread and watery soup and never spoke a word. His arrival reminded me daily of the saying, the gods walk in soft shoes. In other words, the Greeks believed that we cannot be aware of the approach of a divinity. Perhaps in this silence, I was coming closer to God. Perhaps, too, it would make me a better pastor, for I had noticed that the best preachers were men who possessed an inner silence, like Jesus. When the mouth is too much open, even to speak good, the soul loses its fire, just as a room loses warmth through an open door. Slowly I learned that on the tree of silence hangs the fruit of peace. I began to realize my real personality, 
and made sure that it belonged to Christ. I found that even here my thoughts and feelings turned to God and that I could pass night after night in prayer, spiritual exercise, and praise. I knew now that I was not play-acting, believing that I believed. I worked out a routine to which I kept for the next two years. I stayed awake all night. When the 10 p.m. bell signaled time to sleep, I began my program. Sometimes I was sad, sometimes cheerful, but the nights were not long enough for all I had to do. I began with a prayer in which tears, often of thankfulness, were rarely absent. Prayers, like radio signals, are heard more clearly by night it is then that great spiritual battles are fought. Next, I preached a sermon as I would in church, beginning with, Beloved Brethren, in a whisper which no guard could hear, and ending with, Amen. At last, I preached with complete truth. No longer need I care what the bishop would think, the congregation say or spies report. I was not preaching to avoid. Every sermon is heard by God his angels and saints, but I felt that among those around me listening were those who had brought me to faith, members of my flock, both dead and living, my family and friends. They were the cloud of witnesses of which the Bible speaks. I experienced the communion of saints of the creed. Every night I talked to my wife and son. I pondered on all that was fine and good in them, Sometimes my thoughts reached Sabina over the prison walls. She has a note in her Bible from this time. Today I saw Richard. I was lying in bed awake and he leaned over and spoke to me. I had concentrated all my power to transmit a message of love to her. We were richly rewarded for a few minutes thought towards each other every day. While so many marriages were destroyed by prison, ours fell firm and was fortified. Thinking about my family could also wound. I knew that Sabina would undergo intense pressure to divorce me. If she refused and carried on her church work as well, they would almost certainly arrest her. Then Mihai, who was only 10 years old, would be left alone. I lay face down on the pallet and hugged it as if it were my son. Once I leapt up and smashed my fists on the steel door, shouting, give me back my boy. The guards ran in to hold me down while I was given an injection which made me unconscious for hours. When I awoke, I thought I might be going mad. I knew many who had done so. It gave me courage to think of Jesus' mother who stood at the foot of the cross with no word of complaint. I wondered whether we were right to interpret her silence as sorrow unalloyed. Surely she was proud, too, that he was giving his life for man. In the evening of that day, being Passover, she must have sung God's praises according to Jewish ritual. I, too, must thank God for the suffering through which my little son might pass. Again, I took hope. Even if Sabina had gone, we had friends who would surely care for Mihai. One of my constant spiritual exercises was to imagine, as if in a picture, that I was surrendering all my life to Christ. Past, present, future, my family, my church, my passions, my secret thoughts, every member of my body. I confessed my past sins to Christ without reserve and saw him wipe them out with his hand. Often I wept. In the first days, I spent much time searching my soul. It was a mistake. Love, goodness, beauty are shy creatures who hide themselves when they know they are observed. My son had given me a lesson on this point when he was five. I had reproved him. Jesus has a big exercise book and one of the pages bears your name. This morning he had to write that you disobeyed your mother. Yesterday you fought another boy and said it was his fault. So that went down too. Mihai said, after thinking a minute, Daddy, does Jesus write only the bad things we do or the good things as well? My son was so often in my mind. 
I remembered with delight how he had taught me theology. When I read from the epistle to the Corinthians, examine yourself to see whether you are holding to the faith, he asked, how should I examine myself? I replied, thump your chest and ask, heart, do you love God? I gave my chest a blow as I spoke. That's not right, said Mihai. Once the man at the station who hits train wheels with a hammer let me try, and he said, you only give them a little tap in case they break, not a big thump. So I don't have to give myself a thump either to see if I love Jesus. Now I knew that the quiet yes of my heart when I put the question, do you love Jesus, was enough. Each night I passed an hour living in the minds of my chief adversaries, Colonel Dulgeru, for instance. Imagining myself in his place, I found a thousand excuses for him. In this way I could love him and the other torturers. Then I considered my own faults from his point of view and found a new comprehension of myself. It is easier to console others than to comfort oneself, just as we can read with calm sympathy of the guillotine's victims, but are shocked when a revolution threatens us. So now I went on to reverse events in time to think of the present as if it were happening in some previous era and about the past as if it were happening today. In this way, one can even hope to meet the saints of old. I thought what I would do if I were a great statesman, a multimillionaire, the emperor of China, the Pope. I dreamt of what life would be if I had wings or the cloak of invisibility and decided that I had chanced on a definition of the human spirit as an invisible winged force which can transform the world. These were diverting fantasies, but time wasting. A busy architect does not speculate about what he might do with non-existent materials, weightless stone, elastic glass. Meditation, like architecture, should be constructive. But such digression helped me to see how opposed entities can unite in the life of the spirit. And now I understood how Christ can contain all things, be Lion of Judah and Lamb of God, nor did I lack amusement in my empty cell. I told myself jokes and invented new ones. I played chess with myself using pieces made from bread, black versus less black, with chalk from the wall. I could divide my mind so that black should not know less black's next move or vice versa. And since I did not lose a game in two years, I felt that I could claim to be a master. I found that joy can be acquired like a habit, in the same way as a folded sheet of paper falls naturally into the same fold. Be joyful is a command of God. John Wesley used to say that he was never sad even one quarter of an hour. I cannot say the same of myself, but I learned to rejoice in the worst conditions. The communists believe that happiness comes from material satisfaction, but alone in my cell, cold, hungry, and in rags, I danced for joy every night. The idea came to me with boyhood memories of watching dancing dervishes. I had been moved past understanding by their ecstasy, the grave beauty of these Muslim monks, their grace of movement as they whirled and called out their name for God, Allah. Later, I learned that many others, Jews, Pentecostals, early Christians, people in the Bible like David and Miriam, altar boys in Seville Cathedral celebrating Easter, even today, also danced for God. Words alone have never been able to say what man feels in the nearness of divinity. Sometimes I was so filled with joy that I felt I would burst if I did not give it expression. I remembered the words of Jesus, Blessed are you when men come to hate you, when they exclude you from their company and repro reproach you and cast out your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. I told myself, I've carried out only half this command. I've rejoiced, but that is not enough. Jesus says clearly that we must also leap. 
When next the guard peered, pe again, when next the guard peered through the spy hole, he saw me springing about my cell. His orders must have been to distract anyone who shows signs of breakdown, for he padded off and returned with some food from the staff room, a hunk of bread, some cheese, and sugar. As I took them, I remembered how the verse in St. Luke went on. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great. It was a very large piece of bread, more than a week's ration. I rarely allowed a night to pass without, dance, without dancing from then on. Although I was never paid for it again, I made up songs and sang them softly to myself and danced to my own music. The guards became used to it. I did not break the silence, and they had seen many strange things in these subterranean cells. Friends to whom I spoke later of dancing in prison asked, what for? What use was it? It was not something useful. It was a manifestation of joy, like the dance of David, a holy sacrifice offered before the altar of the Lord. I did not mind if my captors thought I was mad, for I had discovered a beauty in Christ which I had not known before. Sometimes I saw visions. Once as I danced, I seemed to hear my name called, not Richard, but another name which I cannot reveal. I knew that it was I who was called under my new name, and it flashed into my mind, I don't know why, this must be the Archangel Gabriel. Then the cell was full of light. I heard no more, but I understood that I was to work together with Jesus and the saints to build a bridge between good and evil, a bridge of tears, prayers, and self-sacrifice for sinners to come over and join the blessed. I saw that our bridge had to be one that even the weakest in goodness could use. Jesus promised that at the last judgment, those who have fed the hungry and clothed the naked will sit at his right hand while wrongdoers will be cast into the outer darkness now every man, surely, sometimes helps others and sometimes fails to do so. The body is one, but the spirit is not. The Bible speaks of the inner man and of the outer man and the new and old, of the natural and spiritual man. It is the inner spiritual man who may achieve happiness in eternal life. I saw that I must love men as they were, not as they should be. Another night, I became aware of a great throng of angels moving slowly through the darkness towards my bed. As they approached, they sang a song of love that Romeo might have sung to Juliet. I could not believe that the guards did not hear this marvelous, passionate music which was so real to me. Prisoners who are long alone often have visions. There are natural explanations for such phenomena which do not invalidate them. The soul uses the body for its own purposes. These visions helped to sustain my life. That is enough to prove that they were not mere hallucinations. One night I heard a faint tapping on the wall beside my bed. A new prisoner had arrived in the next cell and was signaling to me. I answered and provoked a flurry of fresh taps. Presently I realized that my neighbor was conveying a simple code, A, one tap, B, two taps, C, three taps. Who are you, was his first message. A pastor, I replied. From this cumbersome start, we developed a new system. One tap to indicate the first five letters of the alphabet, two taps for the second group of five, and so on. Thus B was a single tap, followed by a pause, then two more taps. F was two taps, followed after a space by one. Even this code did not satisfy my new neighbor. He knew Morse and passed on the letters one by one until I had learned them all. He signaled his name. Bless you, I replied laboriously. Are you a Christian? A minute went by. I cannot claim so. He was a radio engineer, it appeared, awaiting trial on a capital charge, age 52 and in poor health. He had lapsed from faith some years before, having married an unbeliever, and was in deep depression. I spoke to him through the wall every night, growing fluent in the use of Morse. Before long, he tapped, 
I should like to confess my sins. It was a confession broke by many silences. I was seven. I kicked a boy because he was a Jew. He cursed me. May your mother not be able to see you when she dies. Mother was dying when they arrested me. When the man had unburdened many things from his heart, he said he felt happier than he had been for years. We became Morse friends as others became pen friends. I taught him Bible verses. We exchanged jokes and tapped out the movements of chess games. I sent him messages about Christ preaching in code. When the guard caught me at it, I was transferred to another cell with another neighbor and there began again. In time, many of us learnt the code. Prisoners were often moved, and more than once I was betrayed by an informer. So I tapped out only Bible verses and words about Christ. I was not prepared to suffer for political arguments. Men were forced by solitary confinement to delve into deeply buried happenings. Old betrayals and dishonesties returned with inescapable persistence. It was as if they came into your cell and looked at you in reproach. Mother, father, girls long ago abandoned, friends slandered or cheated of their due. All confessions I heard in Morse began when I was a boy, when I was at school. The memory of old transgressions stood like savage watchdogs before the sanctuary of God's peace. But when all other gates to heaven are shut for a man, the Kabbalah tells us, that there remains the Bab Hadimat, the gate of tears, and it was through this gate that we prisoners had to pass.